Thank you for joining us for the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation System for Action Research and Progress webinar. Uh, I'm Chris Lytle, uh, Deputy Director of S4A. Um, for folks who are uh, a little less um, familiar with our work, Systems for Action is a signature research program of the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. Uh, we support studies across the country testing mechanisms intended to align and connect medical, social, and public health systems with a goal of improving population health and advancing health equity. Uh, if you want to learn more about that, uh, please check out our website at systemsforaction.org and follow us on Twitter as well. Uh, but in the meantime, uh, we'll be hearing from uh, one of our uh, projects. Um, hospitals and clinics are increasingly screening patients for social determinants of health. So naturally, referrals to agencies meet the, to meet these needs will also increase. Uh, so today we'll hear about uh, an S4A project led by Daniel Varda and uh, Katie Edwards, which, is, which seeks to develop and implement an approach for assessing the capacity of community social services organizations to observe, absorb and meet the needs of referred clients. Uh, after the presentation, um, we will be uh, taking questions, um, so please uh, enter any questions um, that you have in the Q&A box, and we'll have time for that uh, at the end. Uh, so uh, next, I'd like to introduce uh, Danielle Varda. Uh, she's the CEO of Visible Network Labs, an associate professor at the University of Colorado School of Public Affairs, and the co-director of the CU Center on Network Science. Uh, Katie Edwards, uh, the, the nonprofit center's network, uh, executive director, uh, which is a national network of 170 nonprofit shared space centers that encompass over 3,300 nonprofits. And Todd Eli, uh, who is an associate professor in the School of Public Affairs at the University of Colorado Denver. Rachel Graham, uh, who is uh, coming from the University of Kentucky. Uh, she's an assistant professor uh, at the College of Health Sciences. And Cameron Hodgins, uh, she's executive director uh, of the Glasser Schoenbaum uh, Human Services Center. And Kinsey Adamson, uh, who works as an operation director for Surf Denton. And uh, we'll hear a little bit more about the team uh, and uh, the project that they're working on. So I'll pass it on to our presenter, uh, Danielle Varda. Well, good morning, everyone, or midday. Um, this is Danielle Varda. I am so pleased to be able to represent um, this amazing team on this uh, project. I'm going to start with that because this has been truly a collaborative project. We were thrilled to get our Systems for Action grant. We have been able to present a different time and participate in the different meetings, but um, truly the, the advantage of um, bringing together this kind of cross-sector, community-based research team has been really uh, phenomenal in the way that we've been able to execute this project. So I just kind of want to acknowledge that um, we have uh, today, our commentator, Kinsey, is, is uh, from one of our community sites that we've been working closely with. Um, and we do have a research team of people who have, are still here or not, um, who have worked on this project together over time, which include our university's um, Nonprofit Centers Network, which is a national membership organization, and then some of these human service organizations as well. Um, so, I am, there we go. Oh. Um, I have to move this to presentation. There we go. Okay, I think now I can move through them. There we go. So um, I'll talk about the roles of the people on our project, but our project is really focused on systems alignment between the medical um, public health referrals that are coming to community resources as a result of increased screening on social determinants of health. So We've all seen this, that over time, um, it's been like moving a mountain, right, to get health systems and some of our clinical uh, partners in, in communities to uh, begin to really systematically screen on social um, and economic needs of people uh, that they see as patients and clients. 
Um, and that's been amazing. And we've gotten to so many new milestones around that and payers are paying attention and there are endless amounts of case studies as, uh, of this going on. And what we've started to notice as people who work across these boundaries and primarily represent community-based um, organizations is that there's really not a lot of understanding or talk about the alignment between those referrals and the impact on the caring capacity of communities uh, uh, to absorb them. And so what we mean by that is that there are um, usually a conversation that says we're about to, you know, increase screenings, but not a lot of conversations that are saying, um, what can we do to make sure that when we send them out to communities, those organizations actually have the capacity to provide the services that we are sending people out to. Um, so we set out on this project to really try to better understand what kinds of services and resources primarily the nonprofit and also some of the public sector provide in this changing health systems role and then what is the impact on their caring capacity as the dependence on the sector increases so what will that mean um, over time and what happens if we don't pay attention to that can this system actually work in a way um, where we can close the loop when we might um, not have the resources to provide and so what happens uh, when those referrals are made so this project had uh, four primary aims. The first one was to define what community resources even meant when people said that. We are in a lot of meetings where people would say we're going to refer to community resources and um, it's pretty unclear what that, what that meant. And what we've learned is it can mean from um, uh, domestic violence uh, kind of resources for women and families to um, food and uh, transportation services for people uh, to get to their appointments. So it is quite a range of what people do mean by that. Um, and then we look to determine what factors make up the system um, that could affect a nonprofit carrying capacity. So we created a conceptual framework uh, that really laid out all the components that we might and trying to kind of get away just from um, what we think we've been measuring in carrying capacity, which is like number of beds, let's say, or number of people able to be served, but also like what is the capacity um, in terms of financial strength, what's the capacity in terms of collaborative health and collaborative um, capability and capacity of that community to continue to absorb more and how can we impact that to align um, these systems. Uh, aim three was to identify the existing and potentially innovative financing mechanisms involved in integrating um, these services and aim four to develop strategies to prepare and build the caring capacity of the nonprofit sector to respond as, to the growing demand. Um, I am I am from the public uh, field of public affairs and my area is nonprofit management and one thing that I comment on all of the time is that I go to a lot of um, conferences, I go to all the nonprofit conferences, that I haven't seen sessions yet on you know social determinants of health and absorbing screenings from hospitals. It's not something that uh, the, the social sector is as aware of as we would hope at this point. Um, so we uh, have found there's a, a big education component in here and not only for health systems and clinical um, partners who are referring, but also for the nonprofit social service sector that is absorbing these um, to understand what this change is. And it's, it's a real dynamic, um, there could be a real dynamic impact on the nonprofit sector, primarily the mechanism for funding to nonprofits, which you'll see here in our presentation we looked at. And um, the way nonprofits are currently funded does not actually align well at all with the system that's being created kind of um, through the, these mechanisms. Um, so the way that we approach this project, we wrote the grant with our community partners. Um, Katie from Nonprofit Centers Network reached out to her membership and asked who in the community is actually doing this work. And we picked on um, communities that kind of rose, raised their hand and said, we're, we are doing this. It's a priority for us. And we're, we think we're doing well. Um, and we really, we, so we picked on, on people who we thought were um, already doing work in connecting um, referrals from health systems to social service agencies. Um, we have a community partner team, the research team, and then we would meet monthly with as an entire team. So our community partners, one that you'll hear from today, Kinsey, uh, were with us along the way. They helped develop our protocols. They helped um, work with us in data collection and interpretation. Um, they are still on board as we're trying to build these tools. And so it's been a true community research partnership. Um, and we've been just really uh, kind of proud of um, how that has worked out. Um, whoops, okay, whoops. So this is the problem that we're trying to solve. I've alluded to it. We have a little image of it. So our current system, right, of how things work is we have hospitals and clinical settings that are working in the world. Um, and 
they refer now to people in communities. Um, that's kind of this, this is kind of almost a historical view now. Over our, our two years of doing this grant, um, this has changed, I would say. Our current system is a little more, um, has even more referrals happening. But what we know about community carrying capacity, and that's a term that is we do use in the nonprofit sector and in terms of studies, it's really just the question of what is the capacity of these social um, sector organizations uh, to receive and provide the services for the needs in the community. And we've always talked about it in the sector in terms of, you know, what are the needs of the community and how do we provide for them? Now understanding that there's going to be more targeted referrals from health systems and maybe in, in, in large numbers um, has really heightened the need to understand that capacity. And what we know about the nonprofit sector, these are just proxies, these little um, squares with percentages in them, um, to show that it's really different. Some, some organizations are already at capacity, some not so much. Um, but there is a general sense in the nonprofit sector that it's resource scarce. Um, there's not a lot of buffering um, for a lot of extra resources. It's, you know, I, we always, I always make kind of a joke. It's not like a, you know, like a restaurant where we get more customers and suddenly we have more income. Um, some of these are fee for service. And so there is a correlation between more people coming in and being able to uh, bring an income on that. But the majority of the nonprofit sector are made up of very small nonprofits that are grant um, and um, uh, donation funded. And we'll see that in a minute. So it's so what's happening today, this is our current now, is that we're getting so much more increase on these referrals. So the we would assume that the caring, the capacity of the sectors is going to get um, topped out real quick. If we're successful, if we're really, really good at our screening, like we're trying to do, um, uh, we will quickly and, and, and we get everyone to the organization and we get them to the resource, which we know is another problem we're not even talking about today. Uh, we know that quickly the capacity is going to be um, outfilled. So how do we align the financing mechanisms? How do we align cost savings from hospitals and health systems um, with this need that there is being created in the social sector? Um, and how do we even shift some of that cost savings into um, funding mechanisms that can fund the the folks that are expected to pick up um, that service in the in the community. So our question is, can we build a model that can inform capacity building that can maybe leverage community benefit dollars, local, state, and federal foundation funding, maybe reimbursements for social service delivery and some of that um, Medicaid innovation kind of thinking and funding. So just how do we fund this? Because if we're not asking that question and we're only asking how to do really good screenings and make sure that we're really getting people to the right resource, um, we're not really thinking systemically. So a real systems lens on this means we have to finish thinking, how are we also going to fund when those people get out there? Um, with working with our community partners, they said, well, hey, you know, that's a great model. We believe in it. We see that. But there's even another problem. People are getting stuck before even entering the health system. So they really had us acknowledge, and we talked through this a lot, that a real system lens on this means you go even upstream right before the people get to the screening um, and, and that there's a lot even getting stuck in, in ERs and um, you know, um, urgent care and places like that where we're not even really getting them into the, the system that we're envisioning um, as being successful. These are our two project sites that we worked with, um, and we're going to hear from Kinsey from Serve Denton later. Um, Cameron, who is the lead for us um, with the Glasher um, Schauenbaum Human Services Center, um, have been amazing partners. They have helped us along the way to find things and shared their community data and reports, their United Way reports and things like this that they've been working on. We identified two areas to start with um, to focus ourselves and really try to bound our system that we were trying to um, study. And we focused um, on op opioid and housing and quickly realized we needed to focus on one. So we focused only on housing, um, which by that, what we mean is we were able to kind of bound our questions, bound the concept for people around housing needs for people um, so that we could make the study feasible. All right, so our methods, um, this is our full layout of methods. I, it's an old slide, I thought I would just leave it in here. Um, as you can see, we've, we are at the end of our project as, as the System for Action um, to your grants are. And um, we've done all of these things. We stayed on task and such an amazing project that accomplished all the things. Um, we did some literature review and created a model. Uh, we've done our key informant interviews in this, in this, and site visits in the cities. Uh, we did analysis of those. We've done data collection and a social network survey using the partner survey. We did that um, analysis and have then looked kind of more closely into what kind of financial measures may be available that we can start to understand 
the, the community carrying capacity, which is different, right, from an organization's capacity. So I'm going to go through all of that. Um, and then at the end here, what we're really focused on is dissemination. You'll see at the end, we're working on a website that is a landing page where um, people who are interested in this topic can come. We're building really quick, little, easy tools for people to use uh, to put in some data and, and get quick measures of uh, their of carrying capacity. We're, we're going to be testing that out in the coming uh, months and years um, to, to make sure that we are designing something that's actually useful and, and viable in communities. So I'll, I'll go through all of that. All I'm going to talk about today really is task three and four. Um, we've we, we published our first paper in Health Affairs on the question about what, you know, what is the nonprofit sector and what kind of services are they providing. Um, and then we have three papers under review right now, which cover uh, the qualitative data that we did um, and, and an analysis of that, that's under review. We have another paper that's under review, which is uh, the role of foundations in this work and how foundations might um, use this kind of data in order to uh, inform their strategies and their funding portfolios. Um, and our last paper, which I'm going to cover today, is more of our social network analysis work and um, how we've tried to kind of understand um, collaborative capacity through that uh, methodology. So we've done a couple of um, things to look at that. So I'm just going to go through those here. Um, one of our first questions, so what we did is we administered um, the partner survey, which is an online um, social network analysis survey, um, to both communities. Um, each community had, um, before we submitted or um, launched the survey, we bounded the network, which means that we identified who to include in it. Um, in each survey, the community's uh, members were asked to um, report on um, uh, stuff about themselves um, and their own organizations and the system, and then also to give us information about their relationships with one another, primar but focused on this area of referring, um, screening and referral around social determinants of health and um, specifically on housing, um, we did keep it kind of broad in many ways, but uh, the way that we, we bounded the list of who to include was around a housing issue. Um, the actual survey that we use, which is available if other folks want to take a look at it, is our um, survey on social determinants of health um, in terms of uh, screening and referral networks. So, um, so I'll show you a few things here. And, you know, these network maps, I always say the map is, um, you know, the front cover of the story of these networks and then all the good stuff comes behind it. So maps can be, you know, helpful in terms of discussion and also kind of confusing. But what you're seeing here in this map are the nodes, the circles, or all of the organizations that were surveyed um, in each community. And then the question here that they're answering is just who works with whom on um, this issue of screening and referral. So this is pretty high level and you'll see that we have, um, this is the Denton network, uh, the Serve Denton that Kinsey will speak about. And you'll see the mix of um, organizations that they included is very cross-sector and it actually was a great uh, representation of just how these um, kinds of communities are coming together around these issues. So you'll see the social service nonprofits, behavioral health, children and family nonprofits, um, hospital health systems, housing, um, nonprofit shared space, schools, foundations, and so forth. And, and um, they have quite a mix in Denton of the folks that they included on this. Um, Sarasota is where the um, Glasser Schauenbaum Center is. Um, their network, you'll notice, is a little more dense. So um, they actually reported more connections. It's a small community, um, and they uh, so they looked a little bit different. Um, most of the, I'm pretty sure all of the categories were the same in, in how we coded them. They have more, you'll notice, of a presence of law enforcement and judiciary, judiciary uh, that was represented um, in, in by the by the community. And so, um, and that, that came up at several points in the analysis, um, just the role that they play. But that's that's only you know one of the differences that we saw in the communities. But they were more alike than not. Um, they have some demographic differences for sure. Um, one is a more wealthy community and, and, and one um, has more foundation support in the community, but both have uh, populations either right within their communities or surrounding their communities that have people um, with a lot of social and economic needs. Um, and so both of these communities are working uh, to serve those populations. So the population served by each community is similar. Um, the actual demographics of the community did vary. 
um, we asked them, how successful do you think the efforts have been to uh, address unmet social needs through referrals from hospital health systems to these community organizations? And you'll see, um, surprisingly for us, really um, quite a lot of agreement um, in terms of how they answered it, but what you also see is not a ton of agreement on whether they've been successful or not. So um, almost a split there on whether they are somewhat unsuccessful or somewhat successful, uh, neither successful or successful, and, and so forth. This um, we do a lot of these network studies. We are system scientists, and this is what you know we're doing day to day is is, is studying these kinds of networks and ecosystems. Um, this kind of response to the question of how successful it is, is not unlikely at all. Um, in our partner database, we have over 4,000 networks. This particular question has more variance than any other question in the entire database, meaning that people disagree on the answer to this more than any other question um, that we ask them. So um, perceptions of success of whether these systems are, um, are working varies a lot. We think this is either, we're, we're sure it's not an unreliable question because we've tested for that. Um, what we think is that um, we don't spend a lot of time really as communities or systems defining what success means. And so it's very difficult for folks to report on whether something's been successful or not when we don't really have clear definitions. You know, is success, we really have a good process that works or is success, you know, we're moving the needle on housing outcomes. And because we don't really get good framing and, and cognitive, you know, conversation on that, um, ahead of time, we tend to see that people in systems disagree like this. And so we weren't really surprised to see this, um, but we always also believe it's a really great action step and strategy for communities to use this data point to start building those kinds of strategies for thinking about success. Um, this, so I apologize, it's, a, it's kind of small here, but we pulled out different cuts of the data. Um, Top two figures are Denton and the top bottom two are Sarasotas. And what you'll see here, just on the question of um, who do you refer client, uh, who do you do client assessments with and who are you referring client referrals to? We always thought this was an interesting data point. There's so many, but for the sake of this presentation, we're just pulling out some highlights. Um, but you'll see um, in both cases, client, you know, shared um, client assessment is is less, is, is rarer than client referrals. So there's more like more likely likeliness that the organizations refer to each other, um, but not very uh, likely that they're actually sharing client assessments. I don't think that's a huge surprise. It's a huge effort on a lot of communities' parts is to try to think about intake and shared data. It's a huge challenge for us today, but these data really showed that, and, and you'll see in, in, in Denton there was far less of it um, happening than in, in Sarasota. Um, Sarasota had some very um, specific efforts happening, um, especially through behavioral mental health, around some shared screening um, for folks. And so that was one data point. We actually pulled out where the hospital health systems sit within those networks. And while you'll see that um, they sit in each network, and there's actually proportionally more in Denton um, than in Sarasota, um, they both do sit, um, all of them actually do sit on the periphery in all cases, meaning that uh, they are not the central organizations that are involved in referral um, assessments and, and referrals. Uh, that, that's not too surprising. The social sector is pretty accustomed to referring clients to one another. Um, you know, the, the world of social work is built on the idea that, you know, family systems are important. <laughs> and so um, it, it's not too surprising that the hospital health systems are on the periphery of that work. What I think we're hoping to see over time is that those hospital health systems become more central um, and integrated into those screening and referral systems. Um, here, what you're seeing is we asked folks when they answered questions about each other to rate the, um, them on some um, value and trust scores. And so the value scores are rated on um, their perceptions of each other in terms of their power and influence in the, in the field, level of involvement, and resource contribution. What you're seeing here are the top is Denton again, the bottom is Sarasota. Um, in both cases, Overall, the hospital um, clinical organizations are perceived as being more valuable across those dimensions than the other sectors. And that's just so striking, right, because we, we see and we've done a whole bunch of other research on the um, really important role of the nonprofit sector in providing these services and these social um, um, service referrals. And yet, uh, nonprofits continue to be less um, perceived as less valuable inside, um, in, in terms of those dyadic relational um, 
uh, contributions. And so um, it's not surprising. Uh, uh, Rachel Hogg, uh, Rachel Graham, and I are on. Who's also on the phone, and I have done some work on um, hospitals and the role of hospitals in the past. And um, we consistently see the perception of hospitals as playing central valued roles, um, even when hospitals will report that they don't play that role. So there's there's something that's just so interesting about the way we perceive relationships and people and and organizations and communities and the way they even report their um, role. So just a couple of things here on, um, on we, we asked a bunch of questions on funding. And so, you know, we asked what are factors that have the greatest impact on the ability to provide social services? Um, funding was number one across the board. Opportunities for capacity building and strong relationships with other orgs. Um, you see some difference in the two sites when it came to cost savings and financial efficiencies. But over on the right side, the things that um, did were not reported as having the greatest impact was the political environment, the season or time of year, number of hospital health system referrals. Um, so that really was an interesting kind of way to, to see how this played out. Um, we asked them, what kind of funding do you use to sustain your organizations? Not surprising. We see that most of these who are nonprofit social service agencies rely on grants, donations, or event and fundraisers. Um, some mentioned community benefit dollars um, and so forth, but um, what we were trying to show here and, and understand better is there's kind of this assumption, you know, that um, I think there's a misunderstanding how the nonprofit sector is funded um, and that it's not a very um, agile uh, sector. And so it's very difficult if you're if you're if the need increases threefold in a period of six months, um, it's super unlikely that a nonprofit's going to have some kind of financial reserve to be able to provide extra services. They often have to provide, uh, you know, uh, fundraise, uh, uh, apply for a grant and do that kind of work. So it is not a quick um, capacity building sector. Um, and yet we, we aren't really acknowledging that in the screening and referral work. Some, uh, we asked them what their perceptions of the ability to quickly expand services was, and um, despite that, they do say a fair amount, um, um, which though on the scale is on the lower end as being most um, common, and then perceptions of financial stability. Uh, they actually, most nonprofits and, uh, or sorry, all the respondents reported, uh, they felt very stable, uh, which we found very interesting because we actually pulled uh, quite a few of these community organizations 990 data, which I'm gonna talk about to end here, and um, found that actually when you look at indicators of financial stability based on past um, reported income on those IRS documents, um, it, it does not tell the same story. So there's something very interesting if anyone out there likes to study nonprofit work on, on why nonprofits might report feeling um, quite stable when their financials do not actually reflect that. All right. So um, I'm going to I'm going to talk just uh, flesh that out just a tiny bit here in the in the end of this presentation. Um, you know, we, we did all of that work. What we did is we went back to com the, each community. We went through all the data with them. Um, Kinsey's going to talk a little bit more about that. Cameron, who's not on the phone, um, actually from, from Sarasota, has been um, kind of, uh, 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 she's, she's used the data in so many ways we probably couldn't even <laughs> imagine. And we've presented uh, to their foundations and some community partners. Um, and they are really trying to leverage that information to both show how connected the community is and also to identify the gaps and places where they can improve. Um, and we'll have, I have the opportunity actually to present to that community at, at an event they're doing in February as well. Um, and Kinsey will talk more about her work. Um, but we, we are now, our next steps, uh, you know, our team is, we love publishing, we love working with communities, we like being on the ground and creating action and strategies with them, but we also love creating tools. Um, this might be me at the, the helm of this, but I, uh, I, I'm known, I think, for, for wanting to create a tool at the end, and our team is all on board. It's an amazing team that is thinking about how do we use this data, how do we use this work, and create something back for people so that they can do the same kind of thing that we just did. How can you understand your collaborative capacity, and how can you understand some of this financial capacity? So we are building a tool to help understand the capacity of a community's nonprofit social service organization. Um, we want to provide this framework that includes the financial strengths and weaknesses of a nonprofit community based on organizations collectively and by their service area, which we're using publicly funded IRS data for. And if anyone on the phone deals with 990 data, you're going to know, and we understand the pains of that as well. Um, we're, we're, we're all pretty um, versed in, in, in that. And so we, you know, that's a, probably another discussion, but it's the best we have right now. So we're using that. 
Um, and then we also are looking at um, a tool that can help people understand their measures of collaborative capacity using network outcome measures. So just a tiny bit on that, um, the financial data is an interactive tool that allows users to query a set of primary financial indicators based on their community of interest, like maybe their own community, the service activities based on their NTEE code, which is, you know, their service area code, and then being able to query on other communities so that they can benchmark against it. And so the idea here is that they can pull a number of financial indicators, and we're working on this, and Todd Ely, who is our financial ec economist, who is not able to attend our call today, um, he's doing capstones, um, would be brilliant at talking about this. So I am going to quickly go over this because I can't do it justice in the way he can. Um, but we basically have um, weighted metrics and unweighted metrics for folks to see. And then some selected financial indicators, we pick sur surplus generation, resource availability, and solvency measured by the formula that you can see on the right side there and the indicators that you'll see. And so what we're trying to do is basically within a community, you can query on a number of organizations or by sector. So you can say every organization in zip code 80202. Um, or you can say, I want to look at all the, all the arts organizations in my community. And we can pull these indicators, financial indicators, of the available data of the past years. And it is, it is not the most current data. It's not the current year. But we can pull it, and we, can, we have created an algorithm that will basically show, um, based on all of these different indicators, uh, what the financial health of that community has looked like, at least historically, over the last couple of years. And so, for example, if we are pulling the arts data, then we may say, let's pull it for Denton, let's compare it to Sarasota. So we can say, wow, it really looks like the financial uh, capacity of providing arts um, kind of uh, resources in Sarasota is greater than as reported uh, by the arts organizations in Denton. So that tool, we're actually trying to build up as we're testing it now, we're testing the measures to kind of, you know, even be sure they're reliable and valid. And then we will we are creating this web page where we will we will allow a community to come in and, and play with that, put in their um, you know geographic area, put in their NTEE codes, and and really get to kind of see this because what we're trying to uh, show is that if a hospital is thinking I'm going to be sending a lot of food referrals out to the community, we need to have some kind of sense of what the financial health, the financial capacity is of that social service sector. Um, as a whole um, so that we can plan for that. So the hospital can know I'm in a community where our food, um, social service, uh, finance, uh, historical context is very low as a community, not just by organizations. And that's a place we really need to invest in. So that's how we're kind of trying to align systems here um, and, and work on that. So um, and then on, on this uh, web page that we're, we're building, we'll also have uh, another tool that allows people to uh, get access to um, ways to measure their collaborative capacity. So our goal is to have a landing page, a place where people can come in and it's not perfect and it's not always the most even scientific in the sense that like we are pulling, you know, from data that could have uh, data problems. So for example, if, if an organization didn't report in a long time, it wouldn't be the most current data. But what we know is that we're giving people information that they didn't have before, and we're creating new ways for people to think about caring capacity in communities, and we're creating tools for people so that they can bring data and evidence to bear um, when they're making that case, um, writing grants, or when um, policymakers, uh, government agencies, and foundations are making decisions. Um, so as we know, uh, just to end here, uh, screening for social determinants of health is continuing to increase, and it's just imperative that we think about the capacity of these community uh, resources to absorb the referrals. Um, and while hospitals, um, you know, are shown in our data to be viewed positively for the value they play in the system, um, we see that community-based health and human services are still undervalued, despite their very central and prominent role they play in these systems. Um, so bringing forward the crucial role of these organizations, that they, how they will play um, in successful systems needs to be a key activity for stakeholders and people involved. Um, we believe that by elevating the value of these organizations to a successful system um, could be coupled with policy and funding mechanisms to support the role that community-based health and human service organizations play through different innovative mechanisms, such as reimbursements for non-medical needs among client populations, which we know even some of our systems for action um, partners and colleagues of in, in, this, in these grant cycles are working on. So it's amazing stuff happening. Um, and finally, we, we really 
think that tools for indicating levels of carrying capacity that can become available will help align those funding and policy me mechanisms primarily by increasing an evidence-based, you know, real data-informed way that we can in turn strengthen an entire system. Um, this is our dissemination. We have, I mentioned a number of, of papers. We have built this landing page. Uh, even if you go to it now, it's not built out. We haven't put the tools in yet. Um, our team has, uh, our goal was by today that we are going to have more of that up. And um, as any of you know, the back end of a, a data system and making that public facing um, is, is not a small task. So we'll have that done soon. It's not even a deliverable we wrote into the grant, but um, I don't think we can help ourselves by just trying to make something available for folks. Um, and that's it. Um, I think um, at this point, um, I'm going to turn it back over to, to Chris. I'm not sure um, how we will move through to the next phase. Thank you so much. Um, really interesting work. Um, so the next phase, uh, we've had questions coming in uh, in the Q&A box. So um, I'll just pose uh, some of the questions that, that we have. Um, we still have about uh, 25 minutes or so, so we have plenty of time. Um, ah, actually, um, before that, we do have uh, commentary uh, from Kinsey. Um, so let's, let's, let's get to that first, um, and then we'll get to the Q&A. Great. Well, hi everyone. Um, my name is Kinsey Adamson, as I mentioned, and I have the pleasure of serving as the operations director for Serve Denton. Um, and so kind of going on through here, it looks like this is the, um, the, our sister project uh, down in Sarasota, Florida, um, their, their page. And so we've had the opportunity actually to go visit them and they are a nonprofit center about uh, 30 years ahead of us. And so it was a pleasure to get to work with them on this project and learn from them and where they are in the project um, and in their community and kind of grow with them as well. Um, all right. So let's see here. Um, so Serve Denton is a nonprofit organization and we are located in Denton, Texas and kind of in the DFW area. Um, currently the population for our county is about 836,000. And so we are rapidly growing um, every year. And so as many of you know, because of that growth, the need for social service agencies um, is growing as well. And so at Serve Denton, uh, we strive to partner with nonprofits to help make their services more accessible for people in need. And so we really see ourselves as supporting the nonprofits in our community um, who in turn support the individuals. And we kind of do that in two ways. We own two nonprofit properties in town. Uh, we own the Wheeler House and the Serve Denton Center. So the Wheeler House is a 4,000 uh, square foot transitional housing facility for moms and kids. Uh, we opened that, that was our first project back in July of 2015. And um, since opening, um, the nonprofits there have served over 100 moms and their kids from homelessness. And then at the Serve Denton Center, this is our newer property. Um, we acquired it in 2017 and just finished construction of October this year. Um, it is a 32,500 square foot building that multiple nonprofit agencies office at. So it's one convenient location at an affordable price. And the goal of that is to make services more accessible for people. Um, and so really our vision is to be a one-stop shop for people in the community. And so and as you guys have, we have talked about, transportation is a huge issue for people. And so eliminating that barrier of if you can come to one place and get multiple needs met. And so kind of the way we identify the different nonprofit partners that office on our campus is by using what we call our ladder of self-sufficiency, as you can see on the right-hand side of the screen. And there are 19 areas of needs um, that were identified by HUD um, that a person needs to um, accomplish in order to become quote unquote self-sufficient. So we kind of base the nonprofits that office in our building on meeting one of these needs on the ladder. And so our vision as an organization is to get to a point where we have different nonprofits meeting each of these needs in our community. 
So um, Serve Denton, we currently have 17 different nonprofits um, and a range in services from family counseling to healthcare to a food center, um, abuse recovery, um, offer veterans counseling, foster care services, um, homeless prevention, and, and much more. And so on the picture on the left side of your screen, that's a picture of the Wheeler House. That again was our first project and that's kind of acts as an emergency and transitional shelter for moms and kids who are homeless. And then on the right side of your screen, you'll see a rendering of our Serve Denton Center campus. And uh, we kind of often use this analogy of a shopping mall to describe the different nonprofits at um, office at the Serve Denton Center kind of at a shopping mall, you have different anchor, anchor tenants. So you have, you know, your Macy's and your Dillard's and your uh, JC Penney's and so forth. And so we have that similarly at our center. So as you can see on the screen, phases two, three, and four are our anchor tenants. And so they're operated um, by health services in North Texas. So it's a health center that takes um, both insured and uninsured patients. And um, they uh, advertise that anyone can come and see them, whether they can pay or not. Um, their uh, minimum annual or their minimal fee for a, a visit is about $15. And so they work with everyone across the board to provide those services. And then phase three, we have a children's advocacy center who work with um, children coming out of abusive situations. Um, and then phase four is our food center. So providing uh, food for the people in our community. So those are kind of our anchor tenants, similar like you would see in a shopping mall. And then over in phase one, the front part of our building, is kind of where our smaller nonprofits are. So as you're walking around a shopping mall, you have the little boutiques and stores that you see, and that's kind of how we describe it there. And that's where the counseling and the different services kind of come into play. Um, and so we opened phase one in 2018 and then have slowly added the phases two, three, and four this year. And so we're excited uh, to be finished with construction. Um, the other two buildings that you see on that rendering are um, things to come in the future. That's kind of our vision and goal of where we want to continue to expand to. Um, we were excited to move in at the same time we are currently full. And so we do see the necessity to continue to grow and to continue to, continue to build so that nonprofits are able to office on our campus. Um, and one thing we strive to do is we serve, um, we serve a lot of different nonprofits. So you have everything from a nonprofit that takes up 14,000 square feet on our campus to a nonprofit who is a virtual member and maybe is just a one man show. And so we strive to um, make every nonprofit on our campus feel um, respected and valued and a part of the team and as a place where they can come and work um, and have this community feel um, which we find so important and so we um, have been so great grateful to be a part of the, um, this grant project um, it has allowed us to get a better snapshot of our current state and the nonprofit agencies in our community one major thing that we took away from the data that we collected that uh, Dr. Vado has already mentioned is that um, nonprofits think they're able, that they are more stable than they actually really might be. And I think this directly relates to the capacity of nonprofits. Um, and so thinking that they can handle capacity, they can handle an influx in our community is really important as we are growing. We really need to be aware of um, are we actually able to handle the influx that we are inevitably seeing? And so even, even currently, there are a few organizations in our community that are seriously struggling with uh, grant funding not coming through, and so having to lose a couple of their programs or just um, different leadership struggles um, that might cause organizations um, to dissolve. And so um, another takeaway was just from that is the importance of bringing nonprofits together um, to collaborate and so because we find that when agencies are collaborating when they are working together to serve individuals more can get accomplished and so we see that happening all the time in our building and that makes us so excited we see our health services agency the health center working with the children's advocacy center to provide medical exams to their abuse victims. And so when they bring in a child, they don't have to send them elsewhere to a hospital to another clinic. They can just walk them down the hallway. 
Uh, we see one of our counseling services offering um, free counseling to the moms at the Wheeler House. Uh, we see an organization working with human trafficking victims being able to have a steady primary care doctor that they wouldn't um, normally have um, because it's affordable and they can find it and it's um, convenient for them. And so when these agencies are working together, we have found that it eliminates the duplication of services. And so at Served It, and we are all about supporting and encouraging the wonderful systems that are already in place. And so instead of reinventing the wheel, just supporting the organizations that are already doing such a great job at that particular, addressing that particular need. Um, and then we also think it provides a holistic level of care for clients. Um, not only are they receiving counseling, they, but they can come here and maybe get their utility bill paid, get food for the week, um, and it's all in one place. And so based on the findings that we, the data that we collected and the findings from this project, um, there have been several ideas that we are excited to implement in our community, kind of to help bridge that gap between the social services that we see in our community. Uh, one of the main things we have come to learn is that one of our biggest barriers is um, communication and that proper communication can solve so many problems. And so one thing that we are excited to start implementing are town hall meetings. So we do, you know, town hall meetings with the nonprofits that office with us where it gets everyone in the same room. It gets everyone a chance to share, hey, here's what's going on in my agency. Um, here's the programs that we're currently offering and maybe even so here's how I might need help and other agencies are able to help them but we're excited to expand that into starting to include other nonprofits that are located in our community which will um, you know make the greater um, we'll be able to reach more people by um, bringing in some of those outside community partners and I think by doing that, we will also build trust, which is one of the things we wanted to work on based on the results from, our, from, the, from the data. Uh, when you get people in a room and you start to communicate, trust can start to build. Um, another thing is implementing an intake specialist. So we have hired an intake specialist whose job it is to really be the keeper of all the knowledge in our community. So when someone calls in to serve Denton, she is able to refer them and know it and know all the agencies, not only on our campus, but in our community and what they do and um, how they can, um, how she can refer them to there. And so that, that need is, is critical that we have found. Um, and also uh, this data has allowed us to um, use it in applying to our own grants, taking the information that we have found. Most of the grants um, are, ask, are already asking for that information. And so this data has allowed us to provide some of that, a snapshot into our community that otherwise we would not have. Um, and then probably the last thing is we have been able to build a stronger relationships with some of our hospitals in town, specifically Baylor Scott and White um, has been um, instrumental in, um, they have been um, itching for the data from this project. They are so interested in getting involved and figuring out how they can better uh, refer people to social services in our community. So that we have had them out for several site visits and we're excited to figure out um, specifically in their emergency rooms they have a whole team set up of their team to be trained in knowing what social services are out there in the community and how to refer people to that. So we're excited to continue to build those relationships um, with some of those community partners and especially Baylor Scott and White and some other hospitals in town um, to be able to continue to implement um, things that we can do to grow our community based on the research that we found. So we've been um, really excited and blessed to be a part of this project. Great, thank you so much for the um, commentary, Kinsey. Um, sorry for almost leaving that, that off and getting straight to questions. There have been so many great questions coming in. Uh, that I want to make sure that we had time um, for, uh, for, for you guys to address them. Um, so um, I will choose uh, about three questions. Um, if, if we have enough time, um, and I don't believe any of them are directed to uh, uh, Danielle or um, Kinsey specifically, um, so uh, either one of you can answer those. 
Uh, I'd like to start with a question um, from the S4A team. Um, could you say a little bit more about uh, who you think will be using um, this tool in communities, um, especially outside of uh, hospitals, uh, who have the power to make decisions based on this information? And how will you share the tool? Danielle, would you like to answer that one? I'm so sorry, I was muted. Um, <laughs> I, I was on my way to answering it. Thank you. Um, yeah, I think the stakeholder base that is, the stakeholders who are interested in this um, vary from payers, health systems, um, social service agencies, and then of course people, right? Like everyone in communities. We don't anticipate that this is a tool that people in communities would use, but um, certainly the, the organizations that serve them. And so um, it, it, we believe that this would be um, as much as a discovery tool, discovery of information about your community, as much as um, the data to make decisions. And so what we have encountered, so we partner with or work for, in, in different ways, foundations. And we understand that foundations are really trying to think right now about how to invest um, in this kind of work. Either they are trying to invest in food systems or more broadly, maybe about social and economic um, resources for people. But um, it's really unclear. The evidence base, the, the data on how to invest in these kinds of systems is, is very weak. So we anticipate they would be a user um, and someone who could come to this. Uh, we think, to be honest, when you said besides hospitals and health systems, um, I, we would hope that this would be a tool that hospitals and health systems would use. Um, we think there's a, probably a little bit of education that would have to be done um, to help hospitals and health systems really understand why uh, knowing that data, knowing that evidence will um, help them do their work better. It's, I don't know that all of those connections are, are being made just yet, so we would hope that that would be uh, something for sure. But what we have found with these kinds of uh, projects, and it's one way that Kinsey just talked about it, we've used this uh, with Cameron in the same way. These organizations that are in communities um, are constantly trying to prove their viability, they're trying to prove their worth, they're trying to demonstrate their impact. And so by having tools like this that can um, help them tell that story, particularly if it's a, a story for funding, um, we anticipate that that would be another audience that could come to this and be able to uh, draw on data that they could use in funding applications or to make the case for why investments should be made um, in, in different communities. Um, and then finally, just as a research tool and for folks that are thinking of evaluation or understanding of systems in community um, is, is one way that we would, would, would think about that as well. Um, and I think, I think the other question was on dissemination. And so um, we, uh, I run Visible Network Labs and we've decided to put it as a landing page on, on um, the website there uh, because it, link, it can link directly then into the, um, the partner platform, which is the way that we can do these collaborative, um, these network studies is, is through that platform. And so um, we will disseminate it that way and then just continue to uh, publish on it and, and um, we hope ourselves to get future funding. Um, we're, um, we work with, uh, particularly with uh, Katie at Nonprofit Centers Network and her membership of shared space centers um, to constantly try to identify other folks like Kinsey and Cameron who are doing this kind of work in communities uh, to participate as uh, testers and users of these kinds of tools uh, so that we can not only learn from that, but also uh, you know, make them um, really user-friendly and valuable tools for communities. Thank you for, for that answer. Um, we've gotten a few questions um, focused on uh, financing uh, and leveraging funding. Um, so just from um, you know, connections that you've made, um, Danielle, um, do you have uh, any thoughts on uh, ideas to help uh, community-based organizations fund service expansion? Um, or any other recommendations on how to better utilize Medicaid funding for reimbursable services? 
Well, and, and, you know, I don't know if Kinsey's gotten into that space, but she, I, both of all of our community partners are far better experts on the actual um, integration of services at the local level um, and how those are, are financed as well. Um, you know, so maybe I should actually ask Kinsey first. Do you have uh, any thoughts on that question? <laughs> Not too many. Sim similar to, you know, what I shared We've just seen, um, you know, an increasing number of nonprofit agencies in our community um, suffer because the majority of their funding funding is based on grants, and grants, as you all know, are um, fluctuate and some, and there's no guarantees there. And so, when it's built solely on grants, um, they I think that's where their um, false identity is coming. They think they seem stable, but at any minute the next year it could not come in. And that's what's happened to some of our um, agencies in our community. And so we have learned from that, that building a strong um, donor base, a um, couple of events, um, but just spreading out your funding sources so that you're not so uh, susceptible to um, have to maybe close some of your programs when those fundings don't necessarily come in. And so I think that's one of the major things we, we've learned. Having health services in North Texas in our community, I think is critical because it does, it helps eliminate the, the, the bog down in the emergency rooms because people are able to come get some of those needs met at an affordable cost as well. And so that is a benefit that we've been able to see as well. Um, and I don't, I'm going to take a quick chance here. I don't know if, if, if our colleague Rachel Hogg is able to, uh, Rachel Graham, sorry, is able to um, speak as well, but she, she would, she's one of our um, content experts on this area as well. So Rachel, just chime in if you, if you are able to come in, I'm not sure. Um, but the, um, the only other thing that, that I will add to that is um, it's, it's been a little, um, Remarkable to watch, and this is where our other Systems for Action um, grantee uh, projects are. I wish we could, I have always said, I wish we could all be one project together because I think then we could solve this systemically. Um, the innovative financing mechanism question is something that I think people are studying in more depth and with more expertise than, than I have ever done. Um, and so I've only learned from, from observing in those kinds of ways, but um, I think that it's clear that fee-for-service models are, or reimbursement models are a way that we understand how to increase capacity of our ability to serve people. And so I think as we become more innovative in the ways that we can um, um, uh, fund the social services, so are we funding domestic violence services? Are we funding you know, food services through payer um, reimbursements or other kinds of things like that, I think is w one of the places where we will be able to uh, get traction and sustainability, long-term systemic sustainability on these issues. Um, and, and lastly, one thing I, I always say is, you know, kind of the last infusion of dollars into the nonprofit sector was really when Reagan decentralized services in the 80s and, and really said, we're going to stop providing so many government services and we're going to have these nonprofits do that. And it was a huge change to the sector. It just legitimized the sector. It just made it, you know, something it never was before. Um, and since that time, there has been very little innovation in the nonprofit sector around funding mechanisms. And I truly believe that if we could get this right and we could think of these different ways to reimburse for these social services, it could be kind of like the second time that there is a very innovative, different way of, uh, to infuse the nonprofit social service sector with funding. Um, in ways that we haven't ever done historically before. And so I think it could, it could dramatically uh, bring a more sustainable nature to the nonprofit sector um, if we could actually move forward on that. And so if all of these systems and mechanisms do line up, basically if the stars align, um, then it, it, it could go, but, but we have to be forward thinking on it. We have to be thinking about two, three, and five years, 10 years ahead right now on what we're trying to do. Thank you so much for that thoughtful response. Um, we, we still have a, a, a ton of questions um, submitted from the audience, but um, in uh, respect of everyone's time, uh, we're going to have to go ahead and wrap up, um, but we will follow up with an email uh, with the slides and contact information uh, for the presenters today. Um, so you can direct those questions to them directly and hopefully keep this uh, vital conversation um, going privately. 
Um, and we look forward to um, seeing um, publications coming coming out of this work. Um, it's, it's really exciting. Um, and with that, uh, we will see you uh, at the next um, Research in Progress webinar um, week after next. Thanks. Thank you.